On February 22, 2013, Think Global School received a visit from BBC journalists Richard Lister and Philippa Thomas. While studying the effects of social media in a rapidly changing world, TGS students inquired about the role citizen journalism plays in 21st century media. The BBC reporters gave insights into ethical and moral dilemmas faced in real time while collecting footage for global coverage. Well, good afternoon, everybody. We'll kick off, I guess, if that's all right. Um, uh, my name is Richard Lister. And I'm Philippa Thomas, and you realised whilst you were doing your research that we're connected. Yeah. Well married, <laughs> and um, we actually met. The story about how we met is that the very first time I, I ever saw Philippa, <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I was in a job interview, and uh, I was interviewing for the job of the World Service Political Reporter in London. And Philippa was the newly appointed World Service uh, Political Correspondent. And so the very first thing Philippa ever said to me is, what does the whip do? Um, and the whip is a political uh, role. Uh, it's the person who has to whip in the votes in Parliament. But I do sort of remember that that was the very first thing you ever said to me. And I got the job. So you did. Um, I must have I've never met you right. before. Yeah. So we've, we've started off working together and we've worked together a lot. We worked together as the World Service political correspondents. We then went to the States where, which was State Department correspondent, you had the foreign policy brief, and I was an American reporter. So I had American politics. So we didn't tread on each other's toes, but we worked side by side in the office and travelled around the world together doing a lot of stories. We only travelled on each other's toes when we were the two correspondents sent somewhere, um, particularly to sort of disasters and mudslides and earthquakes. floods and earthquakes. Yeah. And it would be around Christmas time always for some reason. And then the two of us would get sent because we didn't have a family at that stage. And uh, so then they'd be treading on toes. And then there'd be a, there's a chance to take a helicopter up the river to this village that's been washed out. And Philip would say, I'll do that. I'll do it. And I'll say, yeah. I think I've already put my name on the sheet. So he said, yes, but I'm lighter and I can get that. So those are the only times that we ever really, we ever really uh, clashed. Because all journalists are competitive. You all want to get the story. Even if you're my fiancé, I'm still going to go in the helicopter. <laughs> so we both worked for the BBC for 25 years. And that makes us sound like complete dinosaurs, and probably that does actually make us dinosaurs in today's media environment, because as you look at people becoming journalists now, most of them are moving from organization to organization, even if they're working for organizations full time. So many journalists now are working for themselves and selling stories to whoever will ever buy them, and they'll sell them video stories, audio stories, online stories, a combination of all three. And the big broadcasting organizations like BBC, like CNN, like ABC, like all of the other big names in, in international broadcasting are all running to catch up with where this whole thing is going. Um, but we can talk a little bit about our experience. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. We'll, we'll tell you where we've been and then you'll have an idea of, yeah. I know you've done a little bit of research, but if we take turns to tell you mm. some of the stories we've covered and how it might have shaped us as journalists, and then we are pretty quickly going to open it up, because I hear that you're all quite mouthy and you've got lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, really, that's really good. We like yeah. that. So feel, yeah. and also feel free and to just, interrupt yeah. at any time. You know, it's, it's better if you, uh, if you have more to say. Um, I'll start off just with one story. Um, Philippa, you were in the Times Radio Network for a number of years. Yeah. Um, and you were a journalist there for about 10 years. Yeah. So you were there for some time. Yeah. And you were there for the time. Yeah. The opinion that some people have of journalists and the difficulties that you find yourself in as a journalist and the sort of moral and ethical questions that you're faced with. Um, in the 1980s, you may remember from the research and reading that you've done, there was a, a situation in Ethiopia where hundreds of thousands of people died of malnutrition and starvation because there simply wasn't enough. The crops had failed for many years. Uh, there was a BBC journalist called Michael Burke who basically revealed that situation to the world. And as a consequence of that, uh, the Live Aid uh, concert was put together. There was a increased focus on Africa and Africa's structural problems and a lot of people were saved in Africa because there was a big influx of, of food aid and so on and for a while it seemed that the problem had gone away. Uh, in 1999 we were getting reports from the ground in Ethiopia that the bad old days were returning. There had been another series of crop, of crop failures, uh, there had been um, cases of severe malnutrition that uh, local aid agencies were seeing on the ground and Nobody quite knew why this was happening because, after all, Live Aid had sorted everything out. They put all kinds of investment and resources into Ethiopia. All the big donor countries are sending grain to Ethiopia every year. They had food supplies. This shouldn't be happening. Uh, 
Um, I was then in Washington with Philip Brown, and I was uh, then the State Department correspondent, so I was doing a, a lot of traveling with the then Secretary of State. And uh, Ethiopia was one place I'd been through, and they said, could you go back to Ethiopia and just have a look at some of these issues that seem to be arising? So a small team of us went to Addis Ababa, and we went to see these huge areas of warehousing for grain. And this is where the grain stockpile was supposed to be. And so we'd come into what looked like a series of aircraft hangars, really big warehouses, and they were all empty, or there'd be a little pile of grain in the corner. And what had happened was, over the years, the donor countries that were supposed to be sending a regular shipment of aid of, in the form of grain had said, you know, this year, rather than buying grain and sending it to Ethiopia, we'll just borrow from the stocks that you've got. Because you've got plenty of stocks. So this year, we're supposed to send 100,000 tons of grain. Actually, we'll borrow 100,000 from the grain bank, and that'll be fine. Now, all the donor nations have been doing this. So pretty soon, those grain stocks had been exhausted. And grain, of course, was going out in the hard times, and there had been a series of uh, very lean years with a very poor harvest, and so the grain had been going out, and none had been coming in. So we found this in these warehouses in Addis Ababa. Uh, but Addis is a, is a big city, and it was in the north, and it's, it's relatively, relatively insulated from the problems that were happening in the south. So, so we're in Ethiopia, which is a very poor nation, with a government that's slightly uncomfortable about us being there because we're exposing a situation that really shouldn't have happened, and aid agencies are somewhat embarrassed by it. So we had to find a way to get to areas in the south of the country where the problems were really taking root. So using some military contacts, we phoned the Air Force and uh, basically did a deal with a pilot to rent a, a naval helicopter for the afternoon. So we gave them $2,000 and had this guy pick us up in this helicopter in this enormous rubber bladder of fuel so that they could get back from the desert areas that we were going to. So we flew down this team. There was two reporters, a cameraman, a producer, and a translator, a fixer, who, on those kind of stories, that person is the absolute key to whether or not you're going to be successful. Uh, the, the translator, the fixer person, who knows the area, knows who, who's good to talk to, knows what you should be looking for, what you should ignore, who's trying to rip you off, can do the deals that you need in order to be able to get around. And this guy was really good, and he said, I know the area where the reports are of the worst conditions. And so we flew for about two hours, and it started off with sort of green scenery below us, and then greeny brown, and then brown, and finally it was just desert, with really very little in it. And every now and then, after a while, you could see these little sort of villages with 20, 30 houses, and they were just sort of uh, thatch and stick huts, basically. And he said, you know, this looks like a good dawn, we should go down there, and we landed the helicopter and uh, came out. So we've got our day packs and all this gear and cameras and microphones, and we've got water bottles, and we've got, you know, snacks and all the things that, that you take with you when you're going to be out for a long day. And we approached this little village, and... To start with, there was nobody really around. It was the heat of the day, it was noon, it was very, very hot. Everybody was in these little huts. Um, there's a dirt track coming from somewhere a long way away, but they're, they're very, very isolated in these little villages. And we passed one outlying hut, and we could see there's somebody lying in a hut, somebody else is fanning them. And you could see just by looking in through the open doorway that everybody's skinny and, and in not good condition. And so we're thinking, okay, I think, you know, we've got our story here. This is, this is going to be indicative of the problems in these villages. And we're there with, still walking towards the center of this little village. And suddenly this guy, an older gentleman, comes out from other huts with a group of people. And they all start coming towards us quite excitedly. And they've obviously heard the helicopter. And they've seen the helicopter land, and it's a military helicopter. And I'm walking along with all my stuff, and I'm thinking, they think we've brought food for them, and we've brought water for them. And then you think, oh my God, you know, it's just, just me and these guys, and we've all got our kit and our water bottles, and we've landed in this place. And they're all starving, and they've got, maybe sometimes they've got water being delivered, and, you know, you just feel about that big. And you just felt, you know, this is appalling. And the guy comes up, and he's really excited to see us. And um, I said to the translator, you'll have to tell him, you know, we can, we can leave the water that we've got, but... That's all we have, you know. We're actually here as journalists, and so the translator told the um, 
the guy there, who was the sort of the village elder. And he said, he said, no, 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 through the translator. We knew you weren't bringing food and water because we've seen these military helicopters before and it's full of fuel and there's no room. You haven't got nearly enough space for what we need. But what you can do is tell everybody else about the situation that we have in this village. And then the supplies will come. And then I thought, he's understood more quickly than I did, really, about what you can do as a journalist and the good that you can hopefully do, even if you feel sometimes that you're poking your nose into people's lives and you're being a voyeur and you're, you think, oh gosh, there is somebody who's really sick, let's point a camera at them. And even as you're doing it, you're aware of the fact that something about it just doesn't really feel right. But ultimately, if you step out of it the way that this village elder guy did, you can see that maybe some good can, can come of it. Um, so actually, the, the sort of the, the ending to that story was that we did do a lot of coverage, and I was one of a number of BBC teams who did that. And um, the questions were asked in the right places about what the hell is happening with this, country, <coughs> this food that isn't getting through. And eventually, they started uh, an enhanced system of grain delivery. There was a there was a lot of, of, of grain suddenly shipped from Ethiopia. And that year, there wasn't a catastrophic famine. So the only thing, I can be proud of that, even though at the time, it felt very, very uncomfortable to be sort of regarding these really people on the edge of starvation and regarding them as a good story. Um, so but there's also sort of an ethical question, which I could just leave you with to think about, is should we have brought all the food and all the water we could have done on that helicopter and helped? People. Should we have done that? And if we did that, would we have been influencing the story that we were telling, or would we just be doing an act of humanity? And that should have been our first priority. But um, mm. I'll just leave you with that thought. We'll maybe yeah. talk about it a little bit afterwards. And that's something we come back to time and time again. We did, we've done so many different kinds of stories. I mean, we've both been foreign correspondents for a long time. You've come. You've been in 40, 40 countries as a reporter. Well, although I'm not sure that in this Sometimes. audience... Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they've all been everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I've been to 20 some. But we so we have been in lots of different situations. And, you know, we are proud of working for BBC News, which is one of the networks in the world that is about public service journalism. It's about getting there, getting to the ground, getting eyewitnesses, um, try, we think, trying not to spin the facts. We think trying to be impartial and accurate. You may have questions for us on that. Um, but... You know, ethically, I think we're proud of the, the values that our organization at least tries to live by. But there are all these questions, like Richard was just saying about, you know, do you, we've always said, you know, we're, we're just the messengers. We're there to bring you the news, to get both sides or the five sides of the story, bring it back and shape it and present it in a way you're going to want to watch. We are objective. Uh, don't get involved. You can be in some really distressing circumstances where... Should you stop there? Should you forget the story? Should you become, you know, should, should you be helping? You know, we've both covered, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, disasters of all sorts, and you've been to Iraq, and, uh, you know, you're, you're in those situations where you're a professional. Your job is to find the story, scan around, look for the best pictures, think of, is this woman's story the kind of personal story that will make people think about the shape of Iraqi politics because they're interested in what's happened to her? So you're always there and you're scanning and you're trying to bring things out and then you move on. Next story, you know. Uh, and I often find, like with Ground Zero, we both got into America when they opened airspace after 9-11. Um, I got into New York, which went down to Washington. You know, you're 12 hours doing live television from the, you know, standing smelling the smoke from Ground Zero. And you just do it, and you just report it, and you just, you know, okay, they're going to patch me through to, to our correspondent in Israel, they're going to patch me through to Moscow, you know, I'm, I'm presenting from the ground. Da, da, da. Loving the adrenaline as a reporter, you're like, this is a story, this is amazing, I'm in a historic moment. And then I remember going back to the hotel room, gosh, closing the door and crying, because go back, stop being a journalist, taking my earpiece out, wiped any makeup off, and now I'm a human being again. So there is... And, and something I want to talk to, to you more about a bit later. Now that we're not just broadcasting from on high, okay, we're the journalists, you're the audience. Now we've got social media, and the audience talks back, and you can let us know what you think. And you don't have to be a somebody, a politician, a somebody with a press secretary or a PR person. 
anyone can get through on Twitter or by you know putting comments on the website or whatever. People can can reach out and say, you know, this is my community and I don't feel you're reporting it in the right way. So actually I think the pressures have built up. It was easier to go do what you have to do physically and then maybe maybe sometimes reflect at, at leisure or when you have time or when the pressure's off and you file. And, and that's got harder, and journalism's got more interesting, it's got more grey, it's got more blurred, partly because they were talking to you. You know, now there's more meeting in the middle. Um, I'm rambling now, because actually I meant to talk about something else, but you, you made me think as you were talking. But one of the things I just wanted to say about what I do, I got into journalism because I didn't know what to do. I was, uh, <laughs> I, I went to Oxford and studied um, politics and philosophy, and I, it was the time, it was the mid-80s, uh, all my colleagues were going into the city, it was, you know, Gordon Gekko, it was really as good, it was, you know, it was all about, everybody was going to make money. I thought, that's not going to inspire me, and I don't know what to do, and I want to do something where every day is different. I thought, you know, I haven't travelled very much, I want to broaden my horizons, I want to keep asking questions of people. And, you know, it's a chance to be nosy. You get to meet the most amazing people, go in, talk to them, find out what makes them tick, and hopefully understand the situation more. So I had these nebulous thoughts about, I want to go into journalism because it's going to make me think I will never be able to sit back and say, I know what I'm doing, because I don't. I'm going to learn something new every day. So that's not a very kind of high mission statement, is it? But that's why I went into journalism. And then the first big story I did was the Northern Ireland peace process. Um, you know, Living in Britain, growing up in the 70s and 80s, where there are bomb threats on the tubes, and you know, the, there'd be a ceasefire, and then a paramilitary organisation would break. You know, it's, it was there, right on our doorstep. And I got through a political interest. I got into reporting in Northern Ireland, and a lot of the stories that really inspire me are about access to democracy or struggles for democracy, or you know, who defines your identity. And, and so you go from Northern Ireland to. Um, we've both reported from Zimbabwe, which has now banned the BBC, but we've both reported uh, we're from... We're well, back in, yeah, but after, in the years after. Um, and one of the stories I did there involved the self-styled war veterans who were taking over white farms, um, going out in pickup trucks armed to the teeth, and they said, okay, you can jump on the truck, come and see what we're doing. And that's another example. I remember standing there as they went into a farmhouse, were throwing out a family, who were preparing to probably to torch buildings, I didn't stay to see. We got the shots, I did the stand up, and we got out. And then you think about think about that later, but you could then show to an international audience what's happening. Um, I am rambling. But actually, yeah. in, in Zimbabwe, um, that was, that was a, a weird situation where actually the BBC became part of the story because we were really the only foreign broadcasters that were left in, in Zimbabwe challenging the Mugabe regime. And so I was doing sort of lives from the sort of roof of the hotel, and I found out from Mugabe's press secretary that he called me the idiot in the blue shirt. And <laughs> the BBC World, well, you know, you've got an audience of millions who are watching. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the guy. Yeah. I was talking about that recently. Really? Really? Wow. Well, I know. Okay. Um, <laughs> And um, the, the press secretary, who we got to know reasonably well, he was actually quite a nice guy in you know, a rather impossible situation. He would come and say, you say, the president is very cross. He, he almost lost his breakfast over something you said this morning. And so he thought, OK, good. Well, how much longer are we going to be allowed to stay here? <laughs> and as it turned out, it was not very much longer. But I remember on, you know, Philip was often going out doing, doing stories while I was back on the rooftop doing lives all day. And Philip you hooked up somehow with one of these very active groups of war veterans. And his name was, was Hitler. Hitler Hunsey. Yeah, he called yeah. himself Hitler, this guy. Yes. And um, Philippa came over and she said, I'm just going off in the, in the pickup truck with Hitler. And I said, <laughs> right, OK, well, I'll maybe see you later then. <laughs> and, um, and you know, that's another interesting thing. We're just kind of free associating here and we'll let you get in. <laughs> but it's interesting because, you know, now we because we're talking about social media and we both work for rolling news channels, 24-7 channels, BBC World and the domestic BBC News Channel, in a sense, you can get trapped in the office or trapped with the satellite dish. Because they want you on air every 15 minutes and the engineers call us dish monkeys. Yeah, Just stand there and talk. Um, and before rolling news, 24-7 news, 
uh, you had the chance to go out much more and get your reports. And I know you're looking at investigative journalism. But the, you need space to go and talk to people without the deadline, which in our case is every hour sometimes, isn't it? Um, and also not, <clears throat> if you've got a bit more space and a bit more time when you're going out, you don't have to go out with the preconceived idea that will help you frame the story instantly. You go out and see what people are saying, which is often not the story, of course, that the official outlets are giving you. you know? I think so, every time so I've pre-written a story, more, yeah. thinking, oh, I know what this is going to be, I want to turn it around quickly, I need yeah. this guy to say he's against it, I need this guy to say he's for it, I'll do a piece of camera in front of the burnt out shell of the building, and that's, that's my story, and I'll be back here in three hours, and that'll be finished. And you get there, and the guy who's supposed to be for it is against it. The guy who's supposed to be against it is for it, but not for the reasons you might think. And the burnt out building has been demolished. And three other people came up and say, yeah, but there's a body behind there. And you're like, but that isn't the story I came out to do. And now I, you know, I haven't really got time, but that's the story, so I'll have to go and check that out now. And then it turns into something else, and it's a mad scramble, but it's more interesting for it. So you can try and pre-do the story in your head before you get there, but most of the time it never quite hooks out that way. And it will lead you down a blind alley if you if you go down too far with what your preconceived notions are about the story. It's about looking at <coughs> what's actually there, and and the whole also the whole business about journalism now is um, there are so many competitors because you know you see, you've got the BBC, you've got CNN, you've got Al Jazeera, but you've also got all sorts of bloggers and you know the, the local news and and. Quite likely, back you say you're in the field, you've gone to the ground in Zimbabwe or whatever. Your editor is going, yeah, but Sky News has got this amazing footage of the burning buildings. We want you to get the same. And you're like, no, you know, you need to go and get your own stories. So I think, in a sense, actually being a broadcast journalist, it's got tougher to be original and to be investigative because it's keep turning it round. There's the time pressure. There's the competition pressure. Yeah. Um, the, so the, other, the other problem with every, yeah, the other problem with everybody being a journalist now, which everybody is. I mean, you're all journalists. You're posting you stuff tweet and online. You're all writing about your experiences and broadcasting out to whoever wants to read it. Well, Everybody's that's a, a journalist. For them. Who, you know, define a yeah. journalist. Yeah. Who's, who's yeah. Is it just the person with the biggest audience? Yeah. Uh, I mean, or is it somebody? Is it somebody who's trying to expose something in particular? I mean, everybody is a journalist. Every time you tweet, every time you take a picture and send that out into the cyberspace, you're... you're Committing an act of journalism, yeah. And that makes, if your profession is a journalist, that actually makes things easier and also more difficult. Because it's easier because yeah. you have far more sources available than you, you did when we started out, because you have online, you have everybody contributing. But it's more difficult because for every snippet of information you get, every photo that you see, you have to work out whether you can take it at face value. You know, whether, whether what you see is actually representative of the situation on the ground, or whether somebody's spinning it, or somebody's making it up, or somebody knows you're doing the story and is giving you something because they want to influence the way that your story comes out. Now, we get onto this a lot now with the Middle East and with the Arab Spring, yeah. uh, where people will say, look at this atrocity that's happening. They'll send it into the BBC. And then you think, well, if this is true, if these people really have all been shot and buried in the field, then that's really important. Yes. But maybe that picture isn't telling the whole story. Maybe they're old graves, or they're from somewhere else. And the BBC, like everybody, has fallen foul of this. Yeah. And we've, had, we've had photos submitted haven't been thoroughly checked out enough, and they've gone online for a brief period, and then we'll go out into we'll more talk, details. Yeah, we'll talk later. with some of you more about that, about sourcing, about ethics, about you know what you're actually looking at or hearing. Um, I think we'll get to the questions in a minute, but there's also, I think what we're basically saying is, okay, there are so many different kinds of journalists, there isn't a kind of one-size-fits-all, and it can be, you know, I mean, I, I've been a lobby journalist, a political journalist, um, in, in specialised <coughs> transport and business and foreign policy. Um, you can want to write from a point of view or you can hope like we hope we are, you're a kind of impartial public service. Um, you can be video, you can be audio, in fact you better be all of them. Um, and, that's, and actually I it's think it's changing very rapidly. It's changed to an extent where when we 
decided we were going to go into journalism, somebody had to give us a job. We had to be yes. employed by yes. a broadcasting or newspaper organization, and they would employ us, and then we would be journalists. Now, everybody can be a journalist. You can start a blog, you can campaign, you can be an activist, you can have a specialism, and somebody might well pay you to do that, just to be yourself and to report on the things that you're interested in. Now, it's not an easy way to make a living, but it's far more doable than it was when we I've started. I've got one more story, and I think we should take questions, because we, we are... Talking down, too much. We're talking too much. We're downloading on you. Um, but one more story. So I've worked for the BBC for 25 years, and um, now, two days a week, I anchor a BBC World show, so I'm on for 90 minutes, and I'm in the studio, and it's my show, and I'm interviewing people. It's great. Uh, I think, well, I was just saying to Joe, this makes me more nervous. That, I'm um, looking straight into a camera, the audience, maybe 30 million, something like that. But you're just in a studio and it's a camera. Um, yes, this makes me much more nervous. But anyhow, you think that's when I'm at my most influential. But I think the most influential thing I've done in the last couple of years is we took some time out and did a Harvard fellowship a couple of years ago. And I started a blog as part of a course. I was taught how to you know, buy a web domain, get the web page up, you might put it to this. And so as part of my student blog, I go to a meeting where the State Department spokesman is talking, PJ Crowley, he says something about um, WikiLeaks, about government policy on secrecy, confidentiality, and I think, you can't ever stop being a journalist, really. I think, that's news. I asked his permission, actually, was he on the record? And then, and then blogged it. So that's my blog, which has a readership of about 10, because I set it up, you know, a month ago or something. Um, but somebody on The Guardian was following me. The blog gets 50,000 hits overnight. President Obama is asked about it at a news conference the next day. And the guy has to resign. Um, so I <laughs> knocked down the State Department spokesman by blogging two paragraphs on my student blog. And that brought it home to me, even though I was at Harvard to study social media and new forms of journalism. I suddenly thought, whoa, the boundaries have gone. You know, that was informal. It was, you know, took me... 15 minutes to write, and I thought it, it was just almost as an aid memoir. I wanted to keep a record of what it said because I thought if I was at work, that would be a big story. I'm on a student visa, I can't report it, I just blogged it. But you know, and it's, it's you, unexpected you journalism. Basically, attacking government policy. He was attacking government that, that, Yeah, I mean, the story was he was attacking government policy from within, saying, keep, I don't know if you follow the WikiLeaks story, but keeping Bradley Manning in jail is stupid and counterproductive. And um, kind of words you don't normally hear from a spokesman. Uh, yeah, so it was a big story. His biggest um, mistake was uh, when you said, "Is that on the record?" You yes, said yes. <laughs> he paused. He paused. And the uh, I have to tell you though, I did this story. It all moved very fast, and I hated being part of the story because then I'm being phoned for interviews. What did you do? What was it like? And actually, I turned quite a few of them down because I was on a student visa in the U.S., not a working visa. Um, but the good side of the story is he's now employed as a contributor to the BBC website and our foreign policy expert. I think, well, thank God he's not jobless, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I lost a huge amount of sleep over it, but it was a good story and the journalistic instinct kicked in. And actually, they then, they have been treating the, the leak and Bradley Manning, yeah, pretty, pretty appallingly. He was, you know, had been stripped, was being kept in a cell and solitary and they had put suicide watch on him. His condition's got a lot better quite quickly. I mean, he's still on trial, but I think Crowley's remarks going out there made a difference to him. It's a bit like what you were saying indirectly. It was a good thing to report. Yeah. Yeah. What is the way to open yeah. it up is to say, um, just going back to that uh, whole question of um, if you're in the helicopter going off to some poor downtrodden region where you know they're not going to have enough food and water and you're going as a journalist, let's have a quick show of hands. How many people in that situation would think and go for the idea of taking as much food and water as you can carry and delivering it to the people over there. Oh. Okay. How many people wouldn't? And most journalists would be with the second group. So you have a choice. You can either be um, a no longer a, a, an impartial journalist, you're, you're actually playing a role in the story, or you can be you know, the cruel git who doesn't care about these people take pictures of. I mean, there's, like, there's no real easy answer. I mean, whatever you do, you can challenge. Why, why would you take, why would you not take? Um, 
first, I don't think that me not taking water and food for the for the people in the village means that I don't care. It means that because if I just give them water, then what separates me from all the other people who give them water? I'm there to do a job. I'm there to take their story, their how they suffer, and then give it to other people. If I give them water and give them food, then I don't think they will be as interested in me as just them telling me how much they suffer. Because if I give people food and if I give them stuff, they won't, like, they'll be eating, they'll be, like, drinking water for a short amount of time, but they will be happy for that amount of time. And that wouldn't really benefit my story as much as it would. So who, um, who put their hands up to say? Just a question, why couldn't you do both? Yeah. Like, why couldn't you get go there and get the story and then give them whatever you have? If you would have brought it. I mean, that, logistically, it would be very difficult simply because the helicopter was quite small and it was full of fuel uh, because we were going so far out. They had this big rubber, it's called a fuel bladder, which is about the size of an SUV, just full of aviation fuel. And we were literally sitting alongside the helicopter like this, with this fuel thing here, you know. So there was really no room to take anything, and we didn't have a weight. But um, I suppose you're saying, like what, what's scenario. wrong in principle? Mm. Doing that? Well, you have to ask yourself, whether you're affecting the story in some way, I suppose, whether you're, whether what you do is, whether you're making your own actions change the nature of the story that you're reporting on, um, and whether, if you do that for that story, does that mean that all journalists are sort of obliged to you because that's kind of what's seen as acceptable, you know, it's like, well, if you're coming here to do this story, you have to bring some food. And if we did bring, I don't know, two litre bottles of water and maybe enough for everybody to have a drink that afternoon, have we really, have we really contributed anything meaningful to their, It's not clear uh, cut though, is it? Not. Because, you know, if you're somewhere and a bomb goes off and people are losing blood around you, you've done a battlefield first aid course, you're going to get in there and do what you can. You're probably going to be conscious that your cameraman is filming and you might not want to be in the shop. You'd think both. I mean, yeah, you've got to be human, but there, there is a spectrum and you don't want to insert yourself into the story just like you said, you're there to get the story and take it and deliver it. Um, you, you have to be professional yeah. as well. Do you, shall we open up? Um, I know we're going to see some more of the year 11s later. Do you want to ask um, I was just going to uh, make a comparison to the role of journalist to the role of an anthropologist. Uh, so I teach the 9th and 10th grade in anthropology. And your goal is to be a participant observer, but not to sway yeah. the culture or the story. So that kind of goes into what we were just discussing. Like, are you there to make a difference, or are you there to share that difference and then let other people make their own opinions on the matter? Um, and I, I, I open that up to you guys. Like, are you there to share a story and then let your viewers come up with an opinion, or are you there to show here's what the problem is and here's how we can fix it? Or you know, I, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, well, why did what you were saying about you know why can't you do both? Is that is that's a compelling argument. I think if you can, if you can do both. It's a very attractive solution. I'm not sure that you can do both in a way that really makes a difference. Because, um, especially with that kind of story, you know, just to, what you can bring on board is really not going to make a whole act of a difference. Um, I'd also say, purely practically, though, that we're always under massive pressure of time. Because if you're airlifted into a situation where it could be dangerous as well, it could be yeah. hostile, you have a limited amount of time. You definitely have the person with the camera is the biggest target. You have to, what we've been taught about, you know, how you stand to watch each other's backs and where you are and, and all that kind of thing. And you know you've got to get enough <coughs> picture sequences to sell this story to your editor of the news bulletin because, you know, you may say, this really matters. We've been to a camp where people are dying for lack of food. You haven't got the pictures. He's not putting it on his news bulletin. So you have to get there, get the sequences, get some good sound, get a human story, allow yourself enough time to edit it, think, I need to do a radio piece, and then I want to write a blog for online because they'll expect it, and this needs to be done in, you know, 90 minutes. Mm. So yeah. so I think you are driven. It's like, I, just like the, when I was mentioning Ground Zero, incoherently earlier. I did, you do everything under huge pressure of time, deliver it, yeah. and then and come actually, back and reflect. And actually, you yeah. haven't always got time, you know, say, to set up a, a feeding station or to ensure that everybody who who needs the food gets it and the people who don't aren't in such a bad state don't and I mean there is a sort of in some ways you have to leave these things to, to the professionals. Um, but 
but say we can go on all day, can't we? Um, but there are a lot of journalists that we work with um, who may have done the Raspbian war correspondence pretty much for 20, 10, 20 years. And a lot of people move from that into NGOs, don't mm. they? And to, to working for the UN or, you know, you can get to a point, I haven't done much hard edge kind of battlefield, I haven't done battlefield reporting at all. But you can get to a point where you think, I feel cynical about what I'm doing. And I know quite a few people who've then moved on, moved out, said, I've seen so much, I know I have certain skills, I have to make a difference. And I think I was saying to Alex earlier in the day, you know, when you're thinking about careers, it's astonishing that we've been in the BBC for nearly 25 years each, but, but you will have, I don't know, you'll have three, four, five careers, you'll have several running side by side. You know, you'll, you won't expect to do one thing. And, and the intelligence that you get from one period of your life is going to inform your passion to campaign or be a politician in the next one. And, um, I mean, the point you, you made while we were having lunch too, I think, is, is a good one, that it was, if you wanted to be a journalist, when we started to do it, it there was this sort of career path where you went to the School of Journalism and you got an internship and you mm -hmm. tried to work for an organisation. Now I think the field is much more open. If you're the least bit interested in journalism, find the subject that interests you and just get really across it. Because actually, get authority. as more and more people are citizen journalists, the people who are authoritative and well briefed and know their subject, those are the people who are going to rise to the top, they're going to be able to get the jobs in journalism that they might want, because they actually have the brief. And specialists are increasingly important, mm -hmm. um, and particularly so because you know, there is so out much yeah. stuff out there. Yeah. You can find endless news websites, you can find endless news, cable news channels, talk shows. Yeah. but what you can't necessarily find very easily are people who really know what they're talking about. Anybody can do it, but not everybody can do it well. So if you can find the thing that you're really interested in, stick with that and the journalism bit will come later. It's a good question. Um, do you ever choose like as a question, like are there some that you wanted to ask because you thought it would help your story, but you thought it was best not to ask for any given reason? Or well, you, gosh, I mean, you do you ask emotionally probing questions. You can be on the scene of a disaster, and you're talking to to somebody who's just lost their their home or family members, or worse, and you want to tell their story because it's going to a get on the bulletin and b then maybe make a difference because the story has aired. I mean, I've, and then, actually, similar situation, I've, I've talked to people in, I was thinking about the um, Venezuelan mudslides, that story, you talk to people, and they are suffering by telling you what they've been through. And you get it all on camera, and you take it away, and, and that's, that is tough. I mean, we, the BBC doesn't make you do the kind of journal, like the classic newspaper journalism where somebody's died, could you go to the house, could you try to get a picture to put in the face, you know, nightmare to have to do. And we don't, we're not faced with those kind of challenges. But I certainly had to, I certainly talk to people and I push people. And then if there's time, like, in that kind of situation, I can remember one family, um, where the cameraman had to get extra shots, set up shots, and I was able to just sit and talk a little more, and felt more of a decent human being for doing it. But I'd still got them on camera being upset, and I needed to sell the story. I remember I, I was not always in, happy with myself. <laughs> I had I had one situation. I went to North Korea with Madeleine Moonlight, and um, it was a sort of out of the blue thing where I just got a phone call at midnight saying you're going to go to North Korea in 12 hours. You're going to have to get a Chinese visa as we go through China, um, and you need a whole bunch of other paperwork. And I was in the middle of the night. <laughs> what am I going to do? Anyway, we got up early the next morning and managed to get all this paperwork done in a day, and then joined this uh, trip with Madeleine Moonlight, which was going to talk about um, North Korea selling ballistic missile technology around the world. And when we got there, I mean, it, was, it was a very bizarre situation. It is the most, it's the strangest country you can possibly imagine. I described it in pieces, um, it's like a Stalinist theme park at closing time. I mean, there were all these weird, monumental concrete buildings and statues and eight-lane boulevards through the middle of the city with no cars. And at every junction there is um, a woman in this very smart police officer's uniform doing this. And there are no cars. And she'll do that all day, all day. Uh, because that's what you know, and then a, whole, a hooter goes, and uh, all the people doing those jobs are sort of collected up in vans and taken off. 
but that's the sort of the context of this very old place. Everybody that you see walking down the street pretty much is in uniform, it seems. Uh, very militarized. And we had minders. We weren't allowed to leave the hotel without minders. And of course, that was the sole aim of everybody on this trip, was to get out of the hotel without your minder. So you wait till your minder was having a quick cigarette break. And then you bolt for the, the doors and then walk purposely up the street like you lived there and uh, not stop and think, what can I see, you know, and who's going to spot me? Um, but my minder was aware that this was, this was going on. And he was clearly in the situation where he, you know, he told you you're going to have to look after these, these foreigners. And, you know, he wasn't, I mean, a lot of people were always talking about how much they supported the regime and, you know, how wonderful the dear leader was. And they all knew that to be caught saying anything else would mean almost certainly being sent to a concentration camp, of which there are many in North Korea, with really tens of thousands of people in terrible conditions. And I sort of knew that my minder was having thoughts about seeing all of us and showing us things that he was supposed to be proud of and he wasn't particularly proud of. And um, we had the potential to sort of use a hidden camera, even use a bad camera just to get chops of things. And we thought, well, maybe we should ask this guy who spoke English, obviously, as our mind, not very well. Maybe we should just ask him some stuff, you know, and just see if we can get a sense of somebody being critical about North Korea. And we realized that if we did that, you know, it would be, even if we tried to obscure who he was in some way, they would pretty much work out that he would be one of the minders. And you'd be putting his life at risk. So what's more important? Really, you know, do you get that good soundbite and go home and put it on air, or do you yeah. say actually, you know, this guy may be a sort of disaffected secret policeman, but uh, he still has a right to life, I suppose. You know, not being threatened by the community. You had a question. Yeah. I was wondering, how has your ability and like the skills you've had to use as journalists changed as like the way media and information is shared over mm -hmm. the last couple of decades changed? You need three brains and five hands, yeah? yeah. Tweeting, blogging, yeah. It, it's just got more diverse and you have to be a lot more flexible. I mean, we, have, we, do, we are dinosaurs, aren't we? We have worked on the BBC for nearly 25 years. And to begin with, you are either a TV journalist or a radio journalist. And you specialised. And now, you know, they don't send... Everybody cuts costs. Um, you, if you're dropped in the field uh, or on a breaking news story, will probably have to do TV, radio, writing, um, lies, packages. Lies. Yeah, so you have to be comfortable sitting in an edit suite with um, half an hour to put a whole piece together. I'm saying, um, I was on duty <coughs> last Monday when the news flash came out and said Pope resigns. So I literally ran to the news desk and said, You need a piece, give me a suite now. I've got a piece on air in half an hour because this is the top story. Um, so you have to be able to do that, but you also have to be able to sit in a live studio where you're being talked to as an expert and look at ease and sound coherent. And it's a different discipline. And I think there are many more disciplines that you have to bring together yeah. now. And the people who are going to do really well in journalism are the people who are versatile and the people who are early adopters, who say, you know, okay, I'm going to be on Twitter or I'll try out mine or I'll, I'll you know, be, or I'll go and shoot my own stuff. I mean, you, you do, you, you do have done camera work and yeah. some stories, yeah. haven't you? And I've done a bit of editing. And there was a time when we thought, well, we'll go off and just be a freelance team. You have to be versatile, you know? Um, how can you prioritize between which topic is the most, mm -hmm. like, interesting topic? Because, again. <laughs> <laughs> because in my interest, mm -hmm. in every region, there are different interests. And since the BBC is mm -hmm. international, so how can you prioritize which topic you're going to cover? There are, yeah. diff there are different audiences for a start. I mean, you know, there, is, there are different faces of the BBC. So we work for the BBC domestic networks, which really just broadcast within the UK. So they have one set of views. And international news has to be big enough to get on because they're, they're having to compete with so many domestic issues. Then there's BBC World broadcasting around the world, but at peak hours at different times of the day. So, if you're broadcasting at peak time in France, well, that's only noon in the States. So you're probably going to be aiming at the, the tea time audience, which is going to be bigger for Europe. So then you'll perhaps be headlining more European centered stories or stories that you think Europeans are going to be more interested in. Whereas perhaps if there's an American story coming up through the agenda, you wait till 
Europeans are asleep, you put it on when it's peak time for viewers in the States. So there is a little bit of that that goes on, but of course some stories are so big that you think everybody is going to be interested in this to some extent. And we also have that tension all the time between we know it's significant, we know it really matters, but to make people pay attention to it, there has to be something new emerging, which might be a particularly compelling story that illustrates what's happening in Aleppo right now. Or a voice that's got to us, we've got an income. There's somebody we know to be a good talker. Um, or there's a diplomatic breakthrough that means we can talk about uh, Mali again, you know, after having not talked about it for a few days. So there has to be something new, there has to be, it's news, there has to be a new angle. So, um, you know, say the Middle East, uh, we cover Syria, we cover Iran a lot, the Middle East peace process is there, and I know that's, you know, so this is really important. Um, but there has, I mean, you as a State Department correspondent have this all the time. You covered these talks, didn't you? You covered initiatives. But there has to be a reason you're going back to it today. There is so much news competing, and every bulletin is half an hour or an hour. So it's we often have that situation where you can have really heated exchanges over the news desk where you're going, no, we have to lead with this because it's really important, and this is the first thing that the newly re-elected President Obama has said about the Iranian regime. Whatever. And someone else will say, yeah, but the pictures from that, you know, disaster in Beijing or, 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 or you know, or, or the Oscars last night are oh, so much better. We want those up. And you, you can end up having this kind of uh, tug of war between the significant and the superficial stroke sexy yeah? there, there's in that, terms. There's actually also a very interesting we argue about it a lot. difference in the decisions being made by public broadcasters like the BBC, mm. which are not beholden to advertisers. This is key. We can we can say we're going to do this because we think it's important. And people should watch, and commercially funded broadcasters who are going to say very often, we'd like to lead on that, but this is a sort of that. sexier topic. I remember speaking to an ABC News anchor, and they tend to be very much involved in the editorial decisions, and he said, in order to get on what's important, we have to put something higher up the the bulletin that's sexy because that's going to keep people watching. They may have just finished watching Days of Our Lives, and if they see the headlines and the first story they're interested in in the news, they'll keep watching. And then maybe we've got them for half an hour. But if we tell them that there's been another car bomb in Baghdad, even though that might be politically significant for the situation there, uh, they might be less inclined to watch it. So he says, we put our most important stories, probably third or fourth down, but we can get them on that because we can lure people in. Once they've watched a few of the, the, the stuff at the top, which is about, they call them pocketbook issues, you know, things that affect people's wallets and mortgages. And once we've done a bit of that, then we can get into things that they probably ought to know as well. Uh, so there is a real difference between commercially funded organizations, which have to ensure that they've got maximum audience at all times, and publicly funded organizations like the BBC, which don't have quite that same imperative and which can perhaps be more public service facing and do things that they think are significant and important. They spend the money on doing that too. Like, that like that? sending people into Syria is very dangerous, difficult, expensive, and it, it, you know, we can't really have people based in the places like Aleppo that you know, have had a lot of the damage, a lot of the, the, the most um, action. Uh, so we send people in. On that day, Syria will be a big story, even if there's not much happening in Syria, but you've got a chance to get in there and, and show people like on that particular day, we'll, we'll promote it. Um, whereas another organisation might say, yeah, but mm, we haven't, you know, we haven't, we've done a bit it's of this. The, the, just briefly, this, it's the business of the craft of journalism as well. I mean, you are you are selling something, a story, and you want people to give you something. You want their time and their attention. And so, you know, it's a truism, a, a cliche, but important that often the headline writers, especially on newspapers, are some of the most highly paid people in the building. Because you need the snappy headline, or you need the, in TV terms, you'd say we have headlines, and you say we have teasers. So you'll say, here's the main headlines, here's Syria, here's X, here's X. And then Kate, the pictures that show her pregnant on the beach, more later. And your audience is watching you, you know, half your audience is watching you for 20 minutes to see when you're going to come up with Kate, and whether you're going to show the pictures. But in the meantime, you've made them watch a piece about people politics and about Syria. And that's the way around the BBC. So you, you also, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So we you kind of entice people to watch as well. Yeah. Because they can, anyone can turn to any kind of different channel. 
I'm sorry. So, yeah, can we get a, you need to one question from the nines and tens? Somewhat in the nine and ten, and then we'll then we'll split ways so that we could try and stick to the time table a little bit. Please. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you ever felt like threatened by a government to be jailed or abducted because of your strict censor policies, for example, in North Korea or somewhere else in the world. North, North Korea we were protected by being part of a sort of diplomatic mission, so <coughs> you know that, that wasn't that wasn't really a threat. I think places like Zimbabwe, um, Iraq, Chechnya, Chechnya used to be very likely. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there are yes, I think Zimbabwe was the closest. Some, some Central American yeah. states. We have to do what they call hostile environment training, um, some of which is about battlefield first aid, um, and some of which is what to do if you're kidnapped and how to negotiate with your captors and how to create a human rapport so you're not going to be the first to be picked off. You know? um, and the course is so, it was started by the BBC and it's so good, the New York Times sends its people on it, you know, points around the world. I mean, we don't do those kind of, I don't do hostile environment situations anymore, but, but that, that was a fear because you, you, you could be taken because you're seen, you're perceived as biased. Actually, I think it was, it was Bosnia, wasn't it? it was the, this Balkan Wars where journalists mm. were very vulnerable. Which side do you want? Yeah. Yeah. And what and what you say, you know. There's, there was a great story actually from Northern Ireland about, you know, it's one of those stories like uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is very difficult to do in a way that is accepted as fair by both sides. Mm. But in Northern Ireland, it was the same thing. You know, are you Catholic and largely in favour of a United Ireland, or are you Protestant and largely in favour with Northern Ireland's continued union with? as part of the United Kingdom. And there was a, you know, the old line was that you interview somebody and they'd say, well, are you Catholic or Protestant? And you'd say, I'm Jewish, just to avoid it. And they'd say, yeah, but are you a Catholic Jew or a Protestant? <laughs> you know, there's, there's never getting any way from, you know, the, the political rivalry in the country that you're in. And they always want to know, you know, which side you really on? You know, which, what do you, what do you mean by that? The, the, the sort of, the whole idea about being in danger because of what you do. I mean, apart from the sort of physical dangers of, you know, shots going too close and that kind of thing. The, the most danger is always faced by the journalists who live in that country and probably yeah. aren't protected by a big organisation. Because governments know that if you do <coughs> imprison the BBC correspondent, there's going to be trouble at a high level and it's going to be difficult and inconvenient and there's going to be a lot of attention and somebody is probably going to want you in jail. If you pick off some individual yeah, citizen journalist or a translator, mm -hmm. and we had translators in Baghdad who would suddenly have to move to Jordan mm -hmm. because word had gone around that they were working for us, then you know, those are the people who are the most vulnerable. And actually those are the people who you have to care about most when you're working in a, in a foreign country and you're using the local translators, interpreters, fixers, drivers, which you have to do. You are also putting them in danger, and they are more likely to face repercussions than you are as a, an international journalist, who is likely to be slightly more troublesome if, if picked up. And that's, at the moment, it's a very live issue with the BBC Persian service, which is um, watched secretly, in, well, it's definitely across Tehran, but across a lot of Iran, on the kind of contraband satellite dishes. And BBC Persian journalists operate out of our studios in London, but their families back home have been visited, have been told we're watching you, have been told we're unhappy with what your daughter is saying to the world about Iran. And they've come under such pressure that the British Foreign Office is having to intervene to say to the Iranian government, we know what you're doing, we need you to back off. Which they're not showing much sign of doing. And it means that you know those journalists have to think, do I keep, well, I'm safe, but my aunt and uncle might disappear to Edmund Prison. So you're right. We, and then that's, you know, when we, were, when we started talking to you, we were talking about getting to the ground, doing the business, it's a profession, get the pictures, get out. It's sometimes referred to as parachute journalism. And you have to be human as well. We're talking about being personal, being human. And think about the fixes and the translators and think about how what you're doing creates ripples all around you. And when you get the flight out, what are the ripples going to be doing and who will be in danger? So, yeah. I was just wondering, uh, do you consider empathy a detriment uh, if you're a journalist? Such a good question to ask a 
BBC journalists. There's no official line on this, is there? <laughs> there are factions in journalism as well, and the BBC certainly, you know, for decades the BBC was very, you know, we're not part of it. We're completely impartial, and be, to show that we're impartial, we have to be relatively emotion-free. And now, because the boundaries are blurred between the journalists and the audience, uh, and and just I think this we're modernizing you it's about showing emotion you can't you can't stand back i think the best gem to show show the emotion through other people yeah to show that you're affected i think there, there can be a danger of a, a journalist being the story and if if you're too visibly moved in a piece and maybe that's what people remember and it's better that people visibly moved as an audience by watching the people whose stories you're relating to <coughs> let them tell them. And it is, the celebrity journalist has become something that all big news organisations have tried to foster to some extent. Did you, sorry, yeah, I mean, did you, you must have all talked about the Sandy Hook shootings, the shootings in Connecticut, where we had some very anguished editorial discussions back in London about you know, some of the journalists we sent to cover that, like Laura Trevor, mm -hmm. who's really good from New York, had children the same age. And you can't help but think about it. And you're interviewing the parents, and you're standing at the gates trying to get to people. Um, and we were trying, saying, don't put yourself in the camera shop whilst you're talking to the mother. Don't show your grieving face. Because, like you were saying, Richard, we don't want the attention reflected on us. We want to keep it on the story. Um, but. Uh, in fact, most of the American networks, some of them were showing anchors cry on air, which I think we still find horrifying. I but then their audience might have thought they were much more sympathetic. I think the, the answer really is, I think as far as we're concerned, you do have to have empathy in order to tell the story in a way that accurately reflects what it is you're seeing. But you ought to try not to show on screen that you are a part of the situation that you're involved. All you're doing is relaying it. To, to uh, and it's much more it's much more important that you give sort of empathy time to the to the people whose yeah, stories yeah, you're yeah. telling. Yeah. You should have the audience empathize with them and not be upfront themselves saying, look how much I empathize with this appalling situation because it shouldn't I think that detracts really. Now some broadcasters think that actually they want a celebrity journalist in there emoting. And we've had there was one there was one quick story, there was one story, I think it was in Sarajevo where um, there was somebody shot right in front of the yeah, front, yeah, in front of the one particular correspondent, and she did the piece about taking this person to the hospital uh, and having the operation. I can't actually remember but ultimately when they survived, but yeah. that was their story. It was her, and there was lots of discussion about. Well, it's kind of about our reporter taking this person to the hospital. It's kind of about them, it about right? yeah. and and of course she did the this sort of humanitarian thing. Somebody shot in front of you. And they're on their own, and you've got a car. You probably are going to take them to the hospital. You're not going to just leave them. Um, but at the same time, should you film yourself doing that? You know? and those are questions that don't really have a good answer. And questions for you to think about coming off that are, you know, is there such thing as an impartial journalist or an objective journalist? Because it used to be that we would have said, yeah, you know, you get all the points of view, you put them there. That's impartiality. But the way you frame the shots, the way you frame the narrative. How much time, you know, who comes higher in the piece or has more impact? You could argue now that there's no such thing as objectivity, you know? And if yeah. you come from a Western nation, you're probably biased in front yes, of the liberal, liberal biased. nation democracy yeah. small yeah. You know, you probably think democracy is a reasonably good idea. And if you go to a country that doesn't have it, like North Korea, you're probably going to go and show some of the things that you think in your own head make this a not very nice society. You're not really going to be saying, Guys, you know, Stalinism really works. This is great. Look at this. They're doing it differently for the world. You probably are going to show the bookshop, which has got every book. It's apparently by a dear leader. It's his guide to journalism, his guide to plumbing, his guide to catfish farming, his guide to agriculture. He's, you know, that's the cult of personality at play. And you're probably going to give the impression that that's not such a good idea. It's a bit scary. So you can't be truly unbiased, really. Or, or, yeah, or you discuss that and you decide, because that's one of the big issues. And, and ever more so, as you put yourself out on um, social media. I mean, I love Twitter. I'm a Twitter nerd. But the, I would be horrified if somebody said, ah, oh, I know how you vote. Because you can tell from the way you talk on Twitter. 
You know, that would have crossed a boundary, but the boundary is getting harder because you want to show people you're human, you've got personality, and you might try the odd joke or comment or whatever, but you don't want to be seen as partisan. So, so that's a whole can of words that you've opened up for us. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's get the nine and tens to exit. Thank you guys very much. This episode is brought to you by Think Global School. For more information, visit thinkglobalschool.org.